We welcome you to the first installment of the 2023 Expanding Research Partnerships webinar series. The series theme is leveraging collaboration to address key challenges to OSH training, research training and practice. Today's webinar considers different approaches to operationalizing an expanded focus for OSH research based on the themes and recommendations from the Expanded Focus for OSH or the X for OSH International Conference. Before we get started, a little information about our continuing education credits. Free continuing, Asian, free continuing education credits are available for this presentation through the CDC's training and continuing education online system. We are pleased to be able to offer continuing education for a variety of professional groups as seen at the top of the slide. Detailed instructions on accessing the training and continuing education office site are available for download at the website shown on the screen. That website is tceols.cdc.gov. Please note that the live activity number listed on screen is only valid for those watching today's live webinar. You will need the course access code to receive credit. The archived activity number shown on the screen is to be used only by those who view the webinar recording later or attempt to access CEUs after April 8th, 2023. We are recording today's webinar and we plan to post the webinar recording on the CDC YouTube channel, Worker Safety and Health Playlist within a month for those who cannot join us today. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Faulkner, NIOSH's Associate Director for Research Integration. Sarah? Thank you, Nicole. On behalf of NIOSH, I would like to welcome everyone to our March Expanding Research Partnerships webinar. Today, we're pleased to bring together partners from the occupational health and safety community to learn about different approaches to leveraging collaboration in an expanded occupational safety and health research paradigm. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers today. I'll briefly introduce all of them now so we can move quickly between presentations. Their full bios are available on the Expanding Research Partnerships webpage. Our first speaker today is Dr. Lily Tenney. Lily is the Associate Director for Outreach and Programs at the Center for Health, mm -hmm. Work and Environment, and an Assistant Professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, where she teaches graduate courses in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. As Principal Investigator of the Center's Outreach Corps, her work focuses on leading implementation science. She has over 10 years of experience in partnering with industry, government, and businesses to design and implement workplace interventions and research studies. Lily is also co-founder and director of Health Links, an initiative that partners with employers across a range of industries and geographical locations to identify solutions for worker health and safety by providing them with assessment, consulting, and certification. She speaks nationally on the role employers and work environments play in creating a healthier workforce. Welcome, Lily. Our second Thanks, presentation today will be shared by Dr. Gigi Petrie and Dr. Jim Grosh from NIOSH. Gigi is a social scientist at NIOSH and co-manager for the National Center for Productive Aging and Work. She's also an associate investigator for the Center for Excellence in Population Aging Research in New South Wales, Australia, and a research affiliate at the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace, a Total Worker Health Center of Excellence. Gigi's research focuses on issues central to an aging and age diverse workforce, including workplace age stereotypes and age bias, successful aging at work, and worker health and well being. Jim is a senior research psychologist and co manager of NIOSH's Center for Productive Aging and Work. His work at NIOSH focuses on better understanding how behavioral and work organization factors affect a worker's safety and health. Some recent projects include changes in health and cognitive ability that workers experience as they age, characteristics of age-friendly workplaces, job stressors associated with increased risk of heart disease and depression, and the impact of job transitions on both physical and mental health outcomes. Welcome Gigi and Jim. And our last speaker today will be Dr. Kristen Omberg. Kristen is an occupational epidemiologist with a strong research focus 
on the occupational health and safety of workers in precarious employment. She also studies occupational respiratory health and the relationship between work and mental health. She serves as the director of the University of Illinois Chicago's Center for Healthy Work, a center of excellence for total worker health, which has the core tenet of community engagement and participation in occupational safety and health research. Welcome, Kristen. And now we're ready to begin our webinar. Today's presentations will be followed by a question and answer session with the audience. Please put your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar. And now without further delay, I'd like to invite Dr. Lily Tenney to our virtual podium. Lily. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nayash and, and all those that are attending today. I'm excited for this um, webinar series. So I'm here to talk about partnering with employers um, and I'll focus specifically on presenting three case studies from our center that have been ongoing and in partnership with many different types of um, employer groups, organizations, uh, both state-based um, nationally and internationally. And I'll focus on the operationalizing and how we went about um, engaging in these relationships and in these partnerships to really focus on not just research to practice, but research to practice and back to research and having an opportunity to have some more of these programmatic um, initiatives take shape for future research activities. <clears throat> As Sarah mentioned, we are one of NIOSH's in, um, education and research centers. We are also one of 10 centers of excellence for total worker health. And we are based at the Colorado School of Public Health at the unit, which is a collaborative school across three institutions. Um, our campus is based at the University of Colorado Denver and Shoots Medical Campus. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of this presentation, um, my, my, my peers, my colleagues that have been a team in all the work that I'll be presenting today, specifically our international team that has worked a lot with um, sugarcane workers in Guatemala, our health links team, and the SWELL research team that was co-led by Natalie Schwatka, and then of course to all of our partners. I also like to acknowledge our, our funding um, uh, from NIOSH as a cooperative agreement and grants, and also some um, contracted funding from some of the partners that I mentioned here today. So the first initiative that I'll talk about in partnering with business is this initiative Health Links that we started in 2012 as a community-based initiative that was working to reach and engage specifically small employers in the state of Colorado to help them uh, by advising and providing assessment for occupational safety and health with the expansion to total worker health. And the goal of this program was in partnership with, with businesses and employers across um, nonprofit, uh, for-profit organizations to really help them move the mark in six benchmark areas that, so that they could set up the foundation for occupational safety and health. So the program was really based and designed as an intervention where this wouldn't happen without the, um, the collaboration with employers to to begin with. So the way in which we went about the development of this program was we invited employers to the table um, to participate in the development process over the first 18 months. Uh, we invited employers and representatives from um, all different types of industry to first and foremost understand what their priorities and motivation for occupational safety and health are to understand the language that they use when they refer to total worker health and occupational safety and health. And we really learned a lot through that process about the terminologies and the differences in motivations across different types of organizations. So in addition to what you know, was known, what is known from existing literature, this process of, of partner engagement really helped 
in the design process for the initiative itself. Um, so we went and our first goal for this um, to get the program once we established the core components um, based on what we learned from the employers was first and foremost, the employers needed some type of tool to understand and benchmark what they're doing for occupational safety and health. So we developed an assessment tool, which was quick. Um, it needed to be accessible. It needed to be take less than than 20 minutes to complete because there was this, you know, an indication that these are busy the, um, the businesses and while occupational safety and health is a priority, that there are competing priorities. So all of the program components were really centered on meeting the, the challenges and overcoming the challenges that most of these businesses faced, which we learned are quite common, whether or not they're small to midsize or large companies and regardless of industry. So we identified the three components of the program based on our feedback from our, our um, business partners, including this assessment, um, then providing technical assistance in the form of advising to develop healthy workplace action plans and set and track goals for the businesses, and then provide them with existing evidence-based tools and resources and trainings um, so that they are able to implement best practices in total worker health. Through this process, we also learned a lot about the types of representatives from business partners that, per, that are decision makers and also the implementers of occupational safety and health and practice, which is um, one of the biggest challenges we have found is in speaking to such a wide range based on skills, knowledge, um, and also just occupational literacy, uh, health and safety literacy across organizations. So we spent a lot of time on our messaging for this program and our marketing plan so that we were able to reach and be relevant to all of the different audiences that are doing occupational safety and health in practice. Our dissemination strategy, implementation strategy was really focused on four, four, um, four direct arms in connecting with the business community. The first was working with a workers' compensation insurer that uh, helped actually fund this program with an interest of being able to provide another resource to their policyholders. So we provided them with not only um, a, a, as an intermediary, as a, as a gatekeeper to businesses, but also as a way to train their safety consultants to be able to advise on the program health links and then also to as a referral pathway, pathway back to the program. We also connected and formed partnerships with formal MOUs, but also um, less formally in collaboration with different business groups, including chambers of commerce and business coalitions that were really looking for ways to create value add to their membership um, by way of looking at different wellness programs and, and then, um, uh, 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 you know, eventually um, inheriting the terminology total worker health from our program. So, the, the third group we connected with were local public health agencies and state-based public health agencies that were looking for ways to engage with the employer, employer community to deliver total worker health or to deliver different types of programs for mental health, for um, lactation support in workplaces, for disease prevention and management programs. So we formed different relationships with them and also secured some funding. And then the fourth way was direct to business. And that was by um, developing business lists and reaching out to them with a with an outreach strategy. To date, the program um, we have worked with 760 organizations and a variety of in levels of participation. This these organizations represent over 450 thousand in workers uh, in 13 states and in 30 counties in Colorado. So we've seen large impact that's been sustainable over time. A lot of the businesses we've worked with have been working with us since, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, we have a lot of newer businesses and we've learned a lot and published on this project um, over the years. A lot of the engagement has, has maintained with our business community through advising sessions where we have high touch points and also through our trainings, which we offer free of charge to, um, to really reach and continue as educational opportunities for our key audiences. 
So switching gears now, um, I want to talk about the SWELL study, which is really an extension of how we have developed health links as a program for, uh, per, for, for research and for studies. So the SWELL study is an intervention research project that that has since wrapped, but it was a five-year longitudinal study to really utilize this existing um, established intervention health links to determine how interventions at the organizational level modify total worker health of practices and safety climate and health climate. So our goal with the SWELL study was to, uh, to recruit from the health links network a cohort of small employers with less than 500 employees to conduct this study. Uh, this is just, this figure represents our, our conceptual model for the study with uh, the, the, the um, research questions and hypotheses of how a total worker health intervention is adopted and implement, implemented with a dose of leadership training to look at the different outcomes of organizational climate and health and safety climate at the individual level, and, and really represents um, the development of how we, in partnership, have, have looked at different outcomes with the Health Links, health links Network um, across different types of organizations, uh, and to look at not just the organizational level outcomes, but also the worker level outcomes. The, the result of the SWELL study um, has been 12 publications. This is a, a photograph of Dr. Natalie Schwatka, who, who's led the study. And on top, it's a picture of one of our leadership trainings where we had um, representatives from participating businesses participate in a full day leadership training and represents a lot of how we have engaged um, at a richer level with this business community over, over time and have since seen a lot of retention across um, participation in additional activities uh, from our center. The, the third case study is an example of how we've partnered with um, the businesses in the mountain community. So in Colorado, we have um, we have a large uh, we have a large community of businesses that exist and operate in the mountain community, mostly in our ski resorts and in our tourism industry, where they see higher rates of suicide and mental health um, conditions, including anxiety and depression, than other areas in the state. So by way of working with our communities through Health Links, we were um, asked by Vail Resorts, which is the largest um, ski corporation across the country, they own ski resorts all over the country, to provide trainings to their managers and supervisors. So I couldn't help but put one of um, a puppy picture in here because this was actually a picture from our training where we had 200 managers and supervisors from 17 divisions across across the company to come and participate in this and have on, ongoing community-based employer trainings, um, which have since developed into a new recovery-friendly workplace initiative that we've had where we've had 40 employers participate in ongoing learnings this past year, um, representing a variety of industries um, on the topic of how to support employees with um, that have uh, sh struggle with addiction and um, are seeking treatment and then return to work. The last case study I want to highlight in partnership with uh, the business community is one of the largest partnerships that we've had with Pantaleone. Pantaleone is a multinational um, corporation that is an agribusiness and approached us now eight years ago um, in 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 with an interest of expanding their heat prevention program for sugarcane workers in Guatemala. Since then, we have been working with Pantaleone to mitigate the thermal stress and dehydration, um, to investigate um, the and, and to work on prevention for CKDU, um, chronic kidney disease of unknown origin. So, so we have since um, 
had a seven year partnership where we've screened over 5,000 workers in the field. We've had many publications and we've worked across three countries in partnership with Pantaleon to expand on multiple different studies and interventions, including the implementation of total worker health principles at their corporate level, all the way to um, their production and manufacturing and sugarcane um, cutters. This is a picture of um, Lindsay Kreischer from our team on um, one of the first years in partnership with Pantaleon where we've, we developed a hydration study to look um, and, and implement at different outcomes for heat related in, um, injury and illness on the field. Um, and I wanted to point your direction to this publication led by De Deanna Jaramillo, which really highlights and explains the, the partnership that we've had with this agribusiness in Latin America specific to the implementation of total worker health. So to summarize some of the lessons that we've learned through all these partnerships, um, we, have, we have learned that is crucial to be able to assess and prioritize the needs of business partners early. So we, we, the first step we have in working with a business partner is to really understand what their goals and priorities are for occupational safety and health, to build that into a scope of work that will meet their needs and interests early um, with a timeline that also meets their objective. We have a learned that focusing on collaboration versus competition. Um, so I mentioned a lot of the partners we work with and our goal in working with those intermediaries or partners to reach the business community has been in large part with collaboration on mutual goals. We've also learned that assessing ongoing to adjust and there's been, you know, it doesn't go with, without saying um, that there's always things that come up. So we're constantly adjusting the, the partnership, the, the agreements we have with these different partners and the programs that we're delivering to the business community in order to better meet their needs and the changes. COVID was a perfect example of that. We shifted a lot of our different ways in which we we're working with the business community um, to respond to COVID guidance and deliver COVID guidance through the existing program Health Links. We've also uh, really practiced this multi-sector institutional relations, relational power approach where we're looking at different ways we can um, leverage the knowledge of other institutions and also the business um, community to bring their knowledge into what we're doing for, for research and our research questions. Um, quality over quantity wins. Um, by And by that, I mean that um, relationships, these relationships take a lot of effort. So we focus on um, making them, uh, you know, doing, doing um, less better with them um, and having really a good assessment of how, how they're working ongoing. And then we have a large focus on building for sustainability because as we know, the last thing that, you know, that we want is, is to be able to, be, is to build something and then um, exit without a real plan for maintenance of these programs. So in conclusion, some of the major takeaways have been in requiring and early and consistent engagement with the business community and really acknowledging how much effort and management that takes. So uh, jumping to my last point here, you know, having someone who has the, or a team that has the business mentality for identifying opportunities and also, and how to manage them is really important, I think, for our, for our field. Also look, understanding that multiple levels of engagement across the organization, including senior executives, um, safe, safety, um, wellness, the human resource managers are really involved in the work we do with health links and the workforce employees themselves um, is what has, has um, amounted to some of the successes in our business relationships. And then also tailoring approaches for research to practice and back to research projects um, is key. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for that great presentation on the innovative partnerships you've developed for the future of work. And now we'd like to welcome Dr. Gigi Petrie and Dr. Jim Grosh to our virtual podium. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have us come and talk about how we leverage collaborations to address the OSH challenges for workers across the lifespan. Um, I just a brief overview of what our agenda is today. We're going to set the context by giving an overview of uh, population and workforce aging, and also an overview of NCPAS, so you have that con contextual background. And then we're going to talk about four different projects that we have and how we're leveraging collaborations and partnerships in those projects, and then offer some concluding thoughts uh, for people that are interested in in leveraging partnerships and collaborations. So um, in case you're not aware, the population is aging, and this is a global phenomenon that is occurring, including in the United States. So what we see here is a population pyramid from the US Census, and it shows the, the change of the age composition of the population uh, from 1960 and then projected to uh, uh, 2060. And the, the main thing to notice here is that there is a large increase in the number of people that are living to older ages. Now, this shift in the population is also having a big impact on our workforce. So here you can see uh, the proportion of people in different age groups um, in, in the U.S. labor force and projected for the coming decades. And the, the, the key takeaway here is to notice that there, the proportion of people that are age 45 and older is increasing, uh, whereas the proportion of people that are in younger age groups are actually decreasing over time. So um, aging population, aging workforce, and increased age diversity in the, work, in the workplace. Um, currently, what we know is that there's about 24% of the U.S. workforce is age 55 and over. Um, and you can see here, these are the proportions in different industries of people that are age 55 and older in those industries. And these ones that are in orange here, they actually have a higher proportion of workers that are um, age 55 and older. So you, what the, the, the key point here is that this is an issue that really spans industries. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue that affects really all levels of our society, um, both in the US and globally. Um, there is a need for research and resources that exist. The National Academies of Science published this report last year, uh, and um, a couple of their key takeaways, the experiences of vulnerable older populations remain understudied in the current literature. And also we need additional research on workplace policies and practices, as well as job characteristics, such as job demands, job de resources to understand how we might be able to um, improve the employment experiences for people as they age in the workplace. We also know that there is a longstanding research to practice gap. And what this means is that knowledge that's being generated by um, in academic settings, by scholars, is not actually, doesn't necessarily get into the hands of people and organizations that could really use this to help them figure out what are the best practices, what are the best strategies for um, managing and, and supporting their aging workforce. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jim. Great, thank you very much, uh, Gigi, and it's good to be here. Hello, everybody out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about our Center for National or for National Center for Productive Aging and Work and give a couple examples of some partnerships, and then I'll turn it back over to Gigi at the end for a couple additional examples, and then we'll wrap it up shortly after that. Um, so let me just begin with some information about NCPAW. We began in uh, October 2015. We are one of the offices of the Total Worker Health Program here at uh, NIOSH, and both Gigi and I participate in a lot of the Total Worker Health meetings and discussions. Uh, the team is primarily myself and Gigi. Uh, we have a background in industrial organizational psychology, occupational health as well. Uh, we also interact with a lot of the sectors, cross sectors, and different groups within NIOSH. We are referred to as a virtual center. If you're wondering what is meant by productive aging, here is one definition that comes from Robert Butler, who was the first director of the National Institute in Aging. 
and he defined it as an approach that emphasizes the positive aspects of growing older and how individuals can make important contributions to their own lives, their community and organizations and society as a whole. So he was talking about the workplace, but also society in general. And back in the 80s and 90s, this was really a reaction against the view, a more negative view of aging, that as people age, they become more dependent on society and can't make important contributions. And he was arguing that we really need to look beyond that and look for the contributions that people can make and that we need to do that as a society because we're aging. Uh, and our approach kind of stems from a lot of the work that he did and kind of applies it to the workplace. Another way to think about uh, productive aging, and you know, there are other terms you sometimes come across that they're healthy aging, um, successful aging. We call it productive aging with a function with a focus on functioning. Um, another way to think about it is the idea of as people get older, trying to minimize the losses that often occur with aging and also maximize the gains, the things that get better. Um, in terms of our approach to productive aging and work, our model that we've, we've developed has four different attributes. So I'll go through them rather quickly. Um, the first attribution, uh, attribute is a focus on the lifespan. We don't focus just on older workers. Sometimes we do study them, but there are lots of interesting issues in terms of safety and health throughout the lifespan, whether you're talking about younger workers, middle-aged or older workers. Um, another attribute is simply a comprehensive integrated approach to occupational safety and health. Um, total worker health obviously is one of those types of approaches. Another model we sometimes use is the workability model that comes out of the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health and has been ad adapted or adopted in, in many countries now. Um, a third attribute of our model is focusing on outcomes that are important to both workers and employers. And you know, when you talk about something like productive aging, healthy aging, uh, a question often comes up, well, healthy or productive for whom? And what we argue, and this probably won't come as any surprise, is that you really need to be concerned with both. Uh, and this is an illustration of some of the outcomes, perhaps more concerned to workers, and also outcomes of concern to organizations. And uh, a lot of research suggests that there is a bi-directional relationship between those two. So if you do things to improve worker outcomes, for example, let's say you increase job satisfaction, uh, that can lead to organization-centered outcomes, perhaps lower turnover absenteeism. Uh, or if you reduce workplace injuries, disability, et cetera, that may be something the organization desires, but that can in turn lead to a perception of a positive safety culture or safe work environment. So the point of, of our productive aging approach is that you really need to be considered concerned with both of these types of outcomes. And in a sense, when you talk about an age diverse culture, you should be concerned with both and the fact that if you do one, it might influence the other. Finally, the last attribute of the model is simply a supportive work culture for multi-generational issues. We know that there are a number of different age cohorts in the workforce, and they sometimes differ in terms of preferences for things like technology, training, communication, work ethics, things like that. And we need to create a culture that uh, is supportive for different types of preferences that change across the working life. In terms of our goals, I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, we try to develop NIOSH-wide research goals on the aging workforce, build and expand upon collaborations, expand knowledge and interventions and best practices, and develop a broad range of useful translation products on the aging workforce. And when you think of these, these are all things that really require partnerships of one kind or another. And we've partnered with both uh, private companies as well as universities and other uh, nonprofit organizations. And especially I think when it comes to interventions, those really require a multidisciplinary team and perspectives that come uh, at aging and the process of aging, because you really need to try and study it over time 
um, from you know, different angles and, and different perspectives. Um, so let me talk about a couple partnerships. I'll do two, and again, I'll turn it back over to Gigi in just a couple of minutes for a couple other partnerships. So the first one we have is a partnership with the University of Central Florida. As you might guess from that picture there on the screen, uh, this is a focus on the hospitality industry, specifically hotel housekeepers. And um, at University of Central Florida, they are part and receive funding from the uh, Sunshine ERC, uh, which many of you may know is at the University of South Florida and uh, UCF works with them. And because they're in Orlando and the hospitality industry obviously is very uh, strong there, uh, the focus in a lot of what they do at UCF is on the hospitality industry. We've been working with folks in the Department of Psychology there. They have a wonderful uh, psychology department and also the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. And our connection and how this kind of partnership came to be goes back a number of years and some of the relationships we've had here at NIOSH with the faculty at UCF and particularly uh, Dr. Steve Jex uh, for many years was at Bowling Green near Cincinnati here. We worked with him on a variety of different projects. And when he went, went, he went to University of Central Florida, some of that work continued and uh, we have a kind of a joint or a shared interest in occupational health psychology, as well as aging of the workforce, uh, and also a common interest in developing interventions uh, designed to improve occupational safety and health. Uh, just a little bit of background, I'll do this quickly about uh, the need for this kind of work and why both uh, the folks at UCF and NIOSH are interested Hotel housekeepers tend to be a little bit older than both other occupations in the hotel industry, as well as the labor force. Uh, in general, you can see it's 46.5 years on average, um, which is higher than the other two groups. Also, hotel housekeepers really experience a wide variety of different safety and health hazards, a little bit of everything, it seems, you know, whether it's lifting, you know, physical pressures, time pressure, little autonomy, harassment, uh, job insecurity, low wages. Uh, they also have a high rate of injuries and MSDs. The nature of what we're doing with uh, UCF on this, the partnership we have, is developing a supervisory training program uh, designed to increase age-inclusive practices in the hospitality industry. So again, a collaboration with UCF, they have a lot of knowledge and expertise when it comes to the hospitality sector and different occupations, uh, very nice connections, which are really important in any kind of intervention research, obviously, and also a lot of expertise in evaluating training and workplace interventions. And some of the things we're doing just very quickly, we're conducting focus groups and interviews with housekeeper supervisors, we're going to be developing and implementing a four-hour training program for supervisors of housekeeping staff focusing on age-inclusive work practices. And the reason we focus on this type of leadership training is that there's a lot of research suggesting that it is the supervisors, not entirely, but the supervisors do drive the culture often of an organization. So we wanted to begin there. Um, and then finally, we will make these materials in, available online, uh, both a in-person version and also a virtual version of the training. Um, the other collaboration is also with the university. In this case, it is the University of Connecticut. Uh, both the UCHC, which is the health center, which is in Farmington, as well as the main Yukon campus, which some of you may know is up in stores. And this is a manufacturing. And here we are looking at an intervention designing an assessment tool. And we're doing it in collaboration with our partners at University of Connecticut. And at UConn, they have a longstanding relationship with several manufacturing companies in Connecticut. And they've received in the past NIOSH funding for a longitudinal study, which is quite rare in occupational health, on 
musculoskeletal disorders and work capacity in aging manufacturing workers. And they have a wonderful cohort from 2008 to 2014. And then they followed up with that same core cohort between 2018, 2022. Um, and our connection with them in terms of how this partnership came to be is uh, somewhat through Total Worker Health uh, and CPH New was one of the centers of excellence, as many of you know, and we've worked with them over the years, a shared interest in meeting with folks from uh, UConn over the years around the topic of workforce aging. We've collaborated with them on a number of manuscripts, presentations, uh, things like that. And also this, this desire to develop and evaluate interventions. And again, this is something I think just by its nature and complexity leads to uh, partnerships. Uh, again, we're looking at an assessment tool, just a little bit of information about the manufacturing sector, it tends to be an older occupational group. There is growing concern, as many of you know, in manufacturing about a lack of skilled workers uh, approximately 50% 50 50 of job openings in manufacturing currently go un, unfilled. Uh, aging is a concern uh, that we've heard from a number of folks within manufacturing. And although people are aware of the issue and the fact that there's a need to retain qualified older workers, uh, not that many companies are actually taking action. In surveys, it tends to be a little bit under 20% are actually doing something. Uh, so there's a need for effective programs and policies. So again, this is an assessment tool that we are developing. Uh, and you can see that gentleman right there is kind of, you know, perhaps using in a tool that we might develop. And the tool is uh, designed to kind of identify and assess different features in the workplace and manufacturing that tend to be age-friendly or age-inclusive. Um, we are working with UConn and it's a wonderful relationship in that we're able to leverage the knowledge they have of manufacturing, some of their connections with the companies in Connecticut. And we're also looking at a variety of dimensions in terms of this assessment tool, kind of like a checklist that people would complete and then they're given information about actions that might be taken. So we're looking at the physical work environment, organizational policies and practices, psychosocial work factors and health resources that may exist. And this will involve, again, an assessment by a supervisor and then suggestions about what might be improved. We have a long list of items and we are currently working with UConn to develop those items. Uh, so those are two partnerships. Let me turn it back over to Gigi to continue and also she'll be um, including all of this as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. So um, the next collaboration I want to mention, uh, it's, so it's shifting away from these more industry specific to some things that are a little bit broader. So the first one is a collaboration that NIOSH has with OSHA to, um, to update the Small Business Safety and Health Handbook. And this, this actually started a number of years ago um, when OSHA approached NIOSH to, to work on, uh, to collaborate with them to develop this. Um, and that was actually, the update to this was published a few years ago. But um, OSHA said they didn't want to stop there. They would like to expand this handbook and publish some new modules that would be really helpful. Uh, and so they, um, we've actually, some folks in NIOSH have actually published a module already on heat-related illness prevention. But they've contacted us, asked us to work on developing modules that are uh, targeting um, older workers and psychosocial factors at work. And actually, the information that we're learning from developing that, that assessment tool for manufacturing is really informative for this work. So it's, um, it's kind of interesting to take collaboration um, from one project and being able to utilize it in this other uh, collaboration that is uh, with another government agency. The last uh, project um, that we want to talk about, the last collaboration, this is also addressing, you know, a really aging from a very broad stance. Um, 
So uh, I started off by telling you about workforce aging um, and how this is a, it's a big issue. It's a growing concern and yet it's understudied. And going back to this National Academy of Science report, there was a few areas where they pointed out that there were, there's really um, a strong need. And that is looking at intersectionality, which is the combined demographic identities of people, say age and race, age and gender, age, race and gender, and uh, looking at how those may be associated with differences in occupational safety and health. Also thinking about the mediating role of job characteristics like job demands, job resources, and how they may affect those relationships. And then also understanding more about how age bias may constrain employment for people as they age. I mentioned the, the persistent research to practice gap employers are looking for, for guidance, and I have more information on that on the next slide. And then we also know that there's, that we're not the only people that are interested in aging um, and issues around aging. There's other scholars, there's nonprofit groups that are doing this, but yet we're not necessarily coordinating our efforts and collaborating together to um, address this, really what I think of as a grand challenge. So um, we're interested in, in building those relationships and expanding those partnerships. Um, to uh, just to go a little bit more into what employers are looking for. This is from a survey that was conducted by AARP of CEOs um, globally. And they said that they would be really interested in having useful information and tools on a variety of different topics that are really associated with workforce aging and age diversity in the workplace, but yet these things don't exist. So this led us to develop this project um, it's a new project that we have, we're just starting it, um, and it's called Advancing Productive Aging in the Workplace Through uh, Research, Dissemination, and Partnership. Now, this is a, it's a, it's a cross-cutting, cross-sector um, program, not focused on a particular industry, because this is an issue that is affecting uh, a lot of industries and society more broadly. We have three different project aims. The first aim is it's smack dab right here what we're talking about. It's establishing and expanding internal and external partnerships. Um, and this, this can be uh, working with people to complete activities that are associated with this project, but also to establish those relationships for potentially future partnerships and collabor collaborations that we may have. Um, so that's with academic scholars, nonprofit organizations, just to name a few. The second component of this is a research component uh, that is really trying to address those, those gaps that were identified in the National Academy of Science. And we're using two um, publicly available data sets to do this. So the first one is um, an HRS and which is Health and Retirement Study and ONET linked data set to look at longitudinal relationships. And with this one, we're collaborating with Dr. Gwen Fisher, who is a, um, a, a really well-known, highly respected, highly regarded researcher expertise in the, with the HRS data set as well as with um, workforce aging and occupational safety and health. So we're excited to be working with her. We've worked with her in the past and she's fabulous. Um, and then the other one uh, is the quality of work life module of the general social survey. And we're working with establishing new relationships internally here to uh, conduct these analyses. And really, this is looking at workplace discrimination, um, both um, single types of um, discrimination like ageism, racism, and also in combination, you know, experiencing ageism and racism at the same time, and, and how those are associated with health, health and um, well-being. And then the, the third aim of this is really to develop and disseminate resources to the public. And this is where we're going to be leveraging those partnerships that we're um, in the process of developing with this to um, really capture the, the subject matter expertise that the scholars have to be able to summarize the literature and what we know, and then working with these uh, other nonprofit organizations to help disseminate this information out into the hands of people in um, organizations. So um, to summarize, you know, aging and a lot of these issues that we talk about, they're really, they're big problems. They're, you know, grand challenges. And um, these are things that really require collaboration and partnerships to 
um, try and, and address these challenges. And one group cannot do this in isolation. When we work together, each partner brings something new and something unique, a different perspective, a different set of tools, a different set of, of knowledge to this. And so we're better together. How do you go about establishing these, these collaborations, these partners, partnerships? Well, it's network, network, network. Um, it's always, who do you know, not know what you know so much. Um, so go about doing this by attending webinars such as this and seeing who are the people that are presenting and reaching out and contacting them. Uh, going to professional organization, their meetings and, and meeting people there, reaching out to the different total worker health centers and the ERCs and, and finding people there that might share interests with you. So just, just start those conversations. Um, we're always also looking to expand our network. We're looking for you know, people that we might be able to work with in the future. And we're also really hoping that we can help advise people on projects that they have. Um, so we do encourage you to get in touch with us and we're happy to have conversations with you. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Gigi and Jim, for that great presentation on the variety of methodological approaches, collaborations, and partnership activities you've engaged in to promote healthy aging at work in our increasingly diverse workplaces. And now our last speaker today will be Dr. Kristen Omberg. Kristen, welcome to our virtual podium. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kirsten Olmberg from the University of Illinois, Chicago. I am the director of our Center for Healthy Work, which is one of the 10 NIOSH-funded centers of excellence for total worker health. At our center, um, we're principally focused on advancing the health and well-being of those workers in precarious employment. And so today I really want to talk to you about how we do that and the nuances of doing that with a workforce where the employer or the workplace itself is maybe not an appropriate venue in which to advance sort of our OSH training, you know, exercises, resources, and materials. Um, and the way that we really do that and sort of foundational to our approach is using a participatory action research methods approach. Baked into that name is the idea that everything we do is built on deep kind of principles of collaboration, co-learning, and um, including participation from those partners in every step of the research that we do. Um, now that is easier said than done. And so let's dive in and I also realize we're a little behind time so I will try to move quickly but you know our mission at the Center for Healthy Work is simple right you know and, and maybe lofty but to turn unhealthy work into healthy work and we want to work at both hyper local but also regional state and national levels to do this um, and we do focus, as I said, on low wage and precarious um, employment and so let's think about what turning unhealthy work into healthy work looks like. Well, part of that might also be defining what do we as a center and more broadly define as healthy work. And we typically think of this as including things like, you know, stable and fair wages. Really, we're trying to move away from livable to really a thriveable wage. Um, workplaces that are free from those traditional OSH hazards that we think of, but also that are free from retaliation, discrimination that allow workers freedom to have a voice in their workplace. But we also have increasingly worked into our lexicon about how we talk about healthy work, work arrangements, um, consistent scheduling, predictable scheduling, benefits. Um, and these are important because the, the counter side to that is, is how we talk about precarious work and the, the problem that we as a center really try to focus on. So let's talk about that. There's no one sort of accepted definition of precarious employment. We um, collectively as a field have arrived at sort of those primary characteristics of what we would consider precarious employment. These are jobs that are characterized by low wages. They may be unstable or temporary. There is often an ambiguous relationship between the employer and the employee in such that maybe you don't even know who you are directly reporting to on any given day, um, often rigid, lacking flexibility and benefits. 
Um, and these jobs often have very little room for advancement and little protection against retaliation or discrimination. Um, I won't go through all of these sort of in the interest of time, but we know from the work we've done and national attention to this, precarious work is increasing. You know, temporary contingent work is increasing. This is becoming an increasingly big problem in our field in how do we reach these workers? And at what level do we work to improve the health of these workers? Um, if workplaces are sort of precluded as maybe a more uh, obvious choice of how to do that. So I will, most of you are probably very familiar with what is, you know, sort of a standard versus non-standard arrangement. I won't belabor this too long given our time constraints, but, you know, we are really trying to bring attention to work arrangement as an OSH exposure, if you will, really these, these characteristics of non-standard employment, like this ambiguous relationship, this um, contingent, you know, employment leads to things like psychosocial, poor psychosocial outcomes in the workforce and can result in very material things like injuries, right? Um, among, we know that temp workers are among the most vulnerable for some of these class, classic OSH hazards as well. Um, so let's move forward. So how do we reach these workers in precarious jobs? And how do we promote not only occupational safety and health, but general health promotion? And we've really turned to asking the question, well, how can we engage communities, employers, and sort of public health and other governmental agencies to operationalize this? If employers um, are maybe not our primary endpoint in, in our target you know, working population. And as I mentioned, we've really arrived at the way to do that is through these participatory action research methods. Um, and so let's dive in a little bit to what that looks like. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of initiatives and projects that we have in our Center for Healthy Work, one of which is the Healthy Work Collaborative. Um, and this one is really a convening of stakeholders that all have a vested interest in occupational self, um, safety and health, especially among workers in precarious employment, but don't often talk to each other. So that was a project really aimed at bringing stakeholders together to yield sustained um, collaboration to work towards these um, improving the health of workers in low wage and precarious employment. And then the other is to talk about a few of our initiatives and really the process by which the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project operates as it really embodies this participatory approach. And today, you know, we present this work in a lot of different forums. And today, and I hope the audience is okay with this, I'm really hoping to focus on the how, the nitty gritty of how did we find these partners? How do we maintain these partnerships? How do we sustain change that we uh, initiate through these academic community or academic agent, you know, organizational governmental partnerships? So let's talk about first the Healthy Work Collaborative. The overall goal of this, which started in 2017, was to build the capacity of both public health and healthcare sectors to use policies, systems, and environmental change strategies in partnership with other important stakeholders, namely labor and academia to address precarious work. Um, we conducted a year-long mixed methods participatory approach in which we convened stakeholders to tackle this issue and how we get everyone talking together. And the key components of that were really a focus on precarious employment, trying to identify change strategies that could cross sectors, labor, um, healthcare, public health, and also worked at multiple levels. Again, we're really looking at multi-directional and level engagement in all of these conversations. And then you'll notice here that a key component was relationship building. I think many of us in this sphere are very familiar with working on a project um, and maybe being siloed in that work. And there may be other organizations that are working on it. Uh, this project was intentional about bringing those stakeholders together to reduce those silos. So if we think of sort of the work we do in academia, the work that's happening in the labor sector, and the work that's happening in public health and healthcare sectors, we really wanted to bring those together, right? Um, 
to understand that each one of those stakeholders has different expertise, different strengths and uh, resources that we can bring to bear. And that perhaps that partnership could yield more sustainable and more useful outcomes to you know, um, identifying pathways to healthy work for the region and for the population served, right? So ultimately we brought these stakeholders together. We had focus groups, interviews, we had, um, smaller individual or small group work over the span of about a year. And when we talk about how did we even identify these partners, many of these partners that were initially brought to the table were based on longstanding relationships that individuals here at the School of Public Health had with either labor or public health or health care. And I will say this, that like I've heard this in a couple of other projects now, the networks are important. And in our case, those initial networks have often been the starting point. I mean, they're not maybe the end all be all of who we ultimately include, but are the starting points of who you reach out to, out to, to start these dialogues and initiatives. Um, we also realize that everyone has limited bandwidth and ability to do this while they also have full-time jobs. So a big, part of how we do our work and how this work is done and continues to be done is that we would also pay people for their time to participate. Um, these were often small stipends, but to recognize the time and expertise that people are bringing to the table. So that is a very material way in which we invest in these partnerships um, so that it's not asking people to sort of volunteer this, but to say we're putting resources behind supporting these collaborations and partnerships. And really the takeaway from these focus groups and um, the bringing together of these groups was really one, recognizing the, the positionality of the university as a connector, as a facilitator, which I also heard echoed in the two previous talks that these total worker health centers like ours, the Center for Healthy Work can act as facilitators to bring sort of disparate uh, stakeholders together. And that is an incredibly valuable role we play. And that also um, the technical assistance provided by us, provided by labor, enhanced then the approaches that a healthcare system or the public health agencies might take to reaching the workers that they want to serve. Um, and this really yielded new partnerships, which I'm going to get into here, which I think is pretty interesting. So we didn't just bring people together and then say, go on your way, go forth with these new network um, connections you've made. We really wanted to understand how these groups participation and collaboration with each other would change after this intensive um, series of sessions where we brought these stakeholders together. And what's represented by these two pie charts that you see is the pre-collaborative relationships on the left show a smaller percentage of participants saying that they were even in a networking relationship, um, but even more, you know, intimate, excuse me, intimate is this coordination and collaborative relationship. And in the post-collaborative environment, after we brought these stakeholders together, we see a much greater proportion actually say we are, we're working at this most intimate level of professional partnership in addressing precarious employment. Um, so we really appreciated seeing this measured. And to give an example of what that looked like for one in particular group, this diagram is showing sort of a temporal transition over the time span of this collaborative of a healthcare organization who essentially wanted um, assistance and, you know, a strategy for helping to identify occupational injury happening at the hospital, how to identify those accidents when they happen or those injuries, how to respond and put systems in place to prevent those, right? They really wanted to improve their occupational safety at their institution. And at the beginning of this, they sort of had um, a networking relationship or, or a less intimate relationship with um, a legal organization that could help assist in these workers' comp issues and a labor organ and no real relationship with a labor organization that may have actual access to workers in a way that a workplace doesn't. Um, and through the course of this collaborative, you can see this mapping out of how these organizations and participants were actively reporting, self-reporting that these partnerships were changing. And this ultimately 
a, a way we facilitate this, again, is not to bring people together and say, go on your way. We've put resources behind this. So built into the Healthy Work Collaborative was offering the opportunity for these sorts of collaborations to apply for many grants. Um, these would be grants that would offer resources to do exactly what I'm showing here, facilitate this collaboration between stakeholders to address um, issues around health and safety for precarious or low wage workers. Um, and ultimately, we were able to connect these partners. We started early, these mini grants were quite small at the beginning. Over the years, I think the latest funding is up to $15,000. And to date, the Healthy Work Collaborative has spent $138,000. We've supported it through different funding mechanisms to fund these partnerships. So when we're talking about the nitty gritty how, a lot of it is building trust and relationships with partners and then providing resources to execute the ideas, the interventions um, that those participatory relationships yield, right? Um, so ultimately, what we learned out of this Healthy Work Collaborative process was that we could really support a co-learning and knowledge development environment for all of these stakeholders that led to sort of policy systems and environmental change work, which is important because we need change at all these levels, right, to address this really complex issue of precarious work. Uh, we created an intentional space for collaboration and put resources behind it and then put a sustained mechanism in place or a sustainability mechanism in place to keep those moving forward. There was some feedback too for the academic partners, which is that we as researchers really do need time investment to learn the nuances, the, com the complexity of these issues. Um, and that what that does is underscore the time and sort of sustainability commitment that we all need to make when we enter into these partnerships because a lot of it is understanding the different perspectives of these stakeholders coming to the table. So the second one that I wanna talk about is the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project, which is a community-based participatory research project. Um, CBPR or community-based participatory research is a type of participatory action research. This is based in um, the Little Village and North Lawndale areas of Chicago. And I'm gonna place us there in just a moment. But ultimately the goals here are to have community understanding and capacity for advocating for finding pathways to and achieving healthy work for their residents. Um, so this is where we are in Chicago. These are areas of high economic hardship. They are predominantly um, Black and Latinx in population. And like many other big cities, right, Chicago is one in which these historic, the legacy of racism and historic policies that precluded sort of resource and wealth development in communities is still very strong and alive today. And so these are areas in which we are really trying to work on building community capacity um, to achieve healthier and non precarious work. So the principles of CBPR are, are listed here. I won't belabor these too much. I will say that all of these are critically important and maybe most important is recognizing that the community that you are working with is a unit of identity that needs to be recognized and appreciated as having cultural norms, expectations, expertise that they can bring to the table. Um, and in that is recognizing the inherent expertise that community partners bring to the research project that we as researchers may not have. It has, it's deeply rooted in co-learning um, and is a cyclical long-term process. And Jenny Hebert Byrne, who's the PI of our Greater Lawndale Project has actually talked about, I think what this session is trying to get at, which is we say we need participatory research, but like, what does that actually mean, right? Little guidance actually exists for how we form those long-term um, relationships that are really grounded in authentic trust. So this is how we do it in the, the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project. The structure of it is such that it includes faculty, students, um, university staff, community partners, 
and two community partners that are council co-chairs. So everything that happens within the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project is um, decided by the council. And that includes everyone we've just talked about, including representatives from these community-based organizations as well. And in that space, as that council is the primary decision-making body, you get involvement from community at every step of research. Um, again, the council, as I mentioned, is that guiding decision body, provides expertise, and this is the body that also identifies what would be most appropriate interventions in the community for achieving pathways to healthy work, raising awareness about healthy work in this community. They meet regularly. And again, part of the nitty gritty of these relationships is constant engagement as, the, as has been echoed by our other speakers. It's time intensive and just requires a lot of touch points for people to come together in um, a mutually respected space. Um, those partners are similar to our Healthy Work Collaborative, compensated for the time that they are participating in this project. I put this up not to have to go through it in detail, but to say that again, the actual operationalization of this is that every meeting has these ground rules or principles of community engagement. In the case of Greater Lawndale, everything is provided in both English and Spanish. There are interpreters and on site for meetings because again, it is about reducing barriers for community participation in this kind of work. And we set those norms to be intentionally respectful and encourage participation. As I mentioned, the council and community partners are um, really involved in every step of research, uh, including what is that research question, how do we design those interventions, and how do we look at the data, who owns the data, how do we disseminate it. So early on in Greater Lawndale, there was a community health assessment that was really trying to understand community perceptions of their experience with work, um, occupational hazards, their ability to access work and what kind of work that was. And ultimately what came out of it was that there were a lot of barriers identified in the Greater Lawndale region. Um, not only barriers, just access to work, but maybe not having the skills to meet the demands of the work that were, was in their community. There were also um, a lot of reports of worker mistreatment, whether that was wage theft or discrimination, um, but also then you know, recognizing that the community has resources, um, but again, they're sort of siloed and not coming together to promote community healthy work um, and that capacity to achieve healthy work. So with this foundation, the council developed a series of initiatives and there are four big groups of initiatives here. In the interest of time, I will move forward in saying that among these is our Greater Lawndale Loteria Initiative, which was, a, it's a game akin to bingo that was developed to promote knowledge of what is healthy work, the types of work available in Greater Lawndale and beyond, how we advocate as um, individuals for ourselves in the workplace, how we collectively adv advocate for that. Um, and I think there are some critical points within the development of this initiative that really illustrate how we approach partnership and keeping and maintaining that authentic trust that's really important for it. So part of it was that we relied on community expertise in its development. So on the left, you see kind of a snapshot of what these cards are like. Again, it's a game akin to bingo that's very popular. It comes from Mexican culture um, where you know someone will call out a card and then you will place a bean or some other marker on it um, and you win when you get five in a row or four in a row, right? Akin to bingo. This was developed, all the illustrations were done in, um, by a resident of Greater Lawndale, of North Lawndale, Ronica Hicks, pictured here on the left. And then the narratives that accompany those cards that are critical in that education piece were developed by a Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project team member and faculty member here at UIC, um, Allison Dixon pictured on the right. And 
I want to highlight one incident that really tested this principle of community based participatory research and then how we typically maybe function in a university setting. So it was important um, to the Greater Lawndale team that when this product was developed that there no one would be able to profit off of it. So the team moved forward to secure a copyright um, from of the, the intellectual property, right? And typically at the university, we don't allow for kind of novel technology or resources or research products that go on to be copyrighted to be shared by anyone um, other than the university. And so this process of saying, of pushing back on that, because initially the university said, no, like the copyright has to be solely UIC, but we wanted that shared ownership and shared recognition of this product. And it was a months long, um, you know, negotiation with the university, but ultimately we were successful in having this multi-person creative commons copyright statement, where that ownership was then co-shared by the university and the Greater Lawndale um, Healthy Work Project and those who actually contributed to doing the work, which was a major achievement because one thing that we are always aware of when we're working in these spaces is the legacy sort of ab academic institutions, maybe partnering with community partners, but really in the interest of serving just academic um, endpoints and not really serving the community. So this was an example of where we really needed to show that we were willing to push back against our own institution to sort of honor that, that relationship built within this space of the project. There is an intense amount of energy in Greater Lawndale a tr you know, spent on making sure our, dissem our dissemination is equitable. We promote co-authorship by not only academic partners, but community partners. For many of us who in, are in the academic space, this also involves getting community partners on IRBs, um, getting them into presentations to represent this work themselves, and then doing a great deal in partnership with our outreach team to communicate these findings in ways that are accessible to everyone. And, not, and while we also do peer review literature, we also do a big push to make sure that our findings are accessible to all, right, that are not kind of kept behind these firewalls of academic um, peer reviewed literature kind of, you know, our like library firewalls. And so I will wrap up by finally ending with some of the, the challenges or like sticking points that we still wrestle with on an ongoing basis in developing community and partnership with agencies to promote those long-term relationships. And one of them is sort of making sure we're using a common language. And this, we don't want to um, rely too much on jargon or a focus only on sort of these most academic outputs like um, peer reviewed you know, publications, because again, we wanna demystify the language of research. We want to bring it into a space that actually builds capacity among the workers we are trying to um, reach and to translate that knowledge um, so that it actually is useful and can be operationalized at both the community academic and then you know, government or other agency partnerships. Another challenge is limitations in how grant money is spent. When we're talking about working with community, um, food is a critical component to bringing people together. Any of us working in college spaces know that when we provide lunch, students flock to our talks, right? We know this, but it's also something that's not accounted for in our, in our um, funding structures. And so we, we do try to look for creative solutions to be able to budget for food and provide that it, and as a way to foster those relationships um, and those those kind of authentic trust spaces that we are trying to build. We also do, we are working on an initiative to develop actual participatory budgeting for these interventions. So when the council in Greater Lawndale identifies an intervention, we are trying to be transparent. And if we are attempting really to live by the principles of CBPR and engage community at every step. Part of that is budgeting for these interventions. So we are actively trying to develop protocols in partnership with community for how those budgets um, are developed in partnership and are not just something developed uh, within our academic space alone. 
And then finally, I, you know, we do struggle, I think, with any other project with these long, long-term partnerships of change in personnel over time and sort of fluidity with um, how often people are engaged at an intense versus less intense level. And I think this gets back to what have some of our other speakers said, which is that it just requires constant nourishment. Um, that is part of the job to sustain these. And the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project you know, was formally incorporated in 2016, but had been built on uh, projects done by Jenny Heberfern and others going back three to four years before that. So this is going on, you know, a 11, 12 year um, partnership and process. So our key takeaways are not dissimilar from some of the other talks you saw today that we, but we are really, um, seeing that we can demonstrate that PAR, participatory action research, can really help operationalize these ideas around total worker health um, to develop strategic interventions in partnership with our, you know, governmental stakeholders, labor sector stakeholders, and community members that address precarious employment and, and try to work to, you know, diminish occupational safety and health disparities in our workforce. Um, and that really the success of that really rests on just forging these sustained collaborative um, partnerships really built on trust. That's the key of it. So, you know, as I mentioned at the top, a lot of this is about the, you know, recognizing our positionality to be able to bring people together and act as, as a body that can nourish those partnerships into the future. Um, so thank you. I'll wrap up there. I realized I ran a little late. Thank you, Kristen, for your interesting presentation on the how-to of engaging partners to promote uh, healthy work in uh, precarious work environments. And on behalf of NIOSH, we'd like to thank all of our speakers for their presentations on such innovative approaches to leveraging partnerships to address key challenges in an expanded occupational safety and health research paradigm to support worker health, safety, and well-being. This concludes the presentation portion of today's webinar.